molecules that could replicate and compete. But how do they mutate? They mutate because there's the opportunity for recombination between the two genetic loci in this synthetic genetic system. And so there's the combinatorial opportunity for n times m possible recombinants from a library of n variants in gene 1 and corresponding trait and m variants in gene 2 and corresponding traits. All right, so let's do an evolution experiment instead of just a replication experiment. Let's build 12 different forms of gene 1. And you can't see it, but the sequences in each of the gene 1, Watson, and Crick forms are slightly different. And then for each of those different sequences, let's associate with them a different trait. So different sequences in the functional part of the molecule linked covalently to the particular genetic uh, uh, locus that encodes them and that passes information through the replication process. So we'll make 12 variants of, of gene 1 and associated trait, 12 variants of gene 2 and the associated trait, giving a, a combinatorial space of 144. It's, it's a very small space compared to the space that biology gets to play with, at least anything like contemporary biology, but it's still a space to be explored in a Darwinian sense. So now let's do an evolution experiment. And the way we started this experiment, and this is kind of the, the, the scorecard of, pro, of possibilities. So here's the first trait, whether it's A on the Watson side or its partner B prime on the Crick side, or, or likewise B on the Watson side and its partner A prime on the Crick side. So there's 144 possibilities. To start the game off, we seeded the system with the 12 on the diagonal. All right? So this is trait 1 on the left and trait 1 on the right, 2, 2, 3, 3, and so on. We let each of those replicators, the 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, up to 12, 12 replicator, just rev on their own for a little bit and then normalize their concentrations. Some of them produce E a little better than E prime. Others produce E prime a little better than E, but we normalize their concentrations, and that was our seed. So now our seed is 12 different cross replicators, and now we're going to let all of them have at it. So now we have five micromolar of all 12 A's, all 12 B's, all 12 A primes, all 12 B primes, and we seed it with what I just showed you on the previous slide, roughly one micromolar summed of all the E's and E primes, and let them have at it through a serial transfer process. And now the zigzags are not so boring, because now there's differential fitness for different replicators. There's mutation through recombination. Novel recombinants then compete with their parents. If they're less fit than their parents, they drop out in, pop, in, in copy number. If they're more fit than their parents, they gain in copy number. As they gain in copy number or lose in copy number, they change who's in the mixture. And that changes the fitness of other molecules in the mixture, and the game is on. So history begins in this system, and, and carries through. So this was 100 hours, 20 successive five-hour incubations and transfers, resulting in an overall amplification of about 10 to the 25th fold. And so lots of things to ask about this. How did it get from here to there? How did the sequences change? What were all the intermediates and so on? But you know, to just kind of cut to the chase, who won? Well, it's not such a simple answer. There wasn't one winner. In fact, sequencing 50E and 50E prime clones this is what the population looked like at the end. So you notice that the seed molecules, the ones that populate the diagonal, are largely depleted from the population. The molecules, you know, sort of in row 11, column 11, with one exception, are gone because those are bad enzymes. And I know because I designed the 12 different genes and the 12 different traits that went with each of the two alleles. And by the time I got out to number 10, 11, and 12, I was struggling a little bit with the design and doing some kind of unhappy things to the molecule, but who knew? So, so it's, it's a little lighter out here. No, it's, it's sort of row 5, column 3, where most of the action is. And in fact, these three particular recombinants, not present at the start, but arising during the process, the A5B4, A5B3, A5B2 recombinant and their crick partner, together comprise about 50% of the population. Now, why did they win? I don't want to go through this in too much detail because this is kind of the more biochemical analysis, but the bottom line is they won not because they're the best replicators in isolation. The best replicator in isolation is actually the 1-1, one, one, the original wild type. But the 1-1 one, one molecule doesn't replicate very well in the mixture of all the, the substrates. It gets deflected by non-productive complexes with some of the other substrates. Now, the best replicators in this big mix are these three. So that's part of why they won. They are efficient replicators in this complex mixture. And there's a second reason why they win. Uh, they're neighbors to each other, and their most favored cross-mutation, their, their most favored mutational pathway is to each other. 
So the most common mutations are from A5B3 to A5B2 or to A5B4 and back again. So they, they form a kind of clique that is fit under the conditions and, and operate kind of as a team, so to speak, through cross-mutational pathways. Okay, so that's a kind of first shot at this, but we want more complexity. We want more bits. We want more variation in the system. We want the molecule to evolve more complex things. So that means we need more genetic variation and then more corresponding trait variation. So here's the next experiment. Uh, this is not uh, yet published, where we made a more complex set of 64 variants in gene 1 and 64 variants in gene 2. And, and the way this is set up, actually, is it's what's called a KKMM library, where K is either G or U, so two possibilities at this position, two possibilities at that position, M is A or C, two possibilities here, two possibilities here. So, um, so that combinatorial library of genes was inserted in each of the two different loci. In this experiment, what we did was we placed the exact same trait in combination with all the different genes. And we thought that was an important first experiment to do. Why? Because because we're worried about the extent to which genotype has phenotype. Now, let me try to explain what I mean by that. So, you know, what is genotype? Genotype is not your DNA, okay? Because your DNA is a molecule, and a molecule has, you know, a physical representation, and therefore it has differential fitness depending on what sequence it carries. Genotype is just the information, I would say. And once that information is represented in a physical molecule, there's already phenotype. Your DNA has phenotype as a molecule. There are certain sequences that you can't have in your DNA because they're really hard to replicate. Uh, or they make really awkward structures that block other processes. Or maybe they work, but they don't work as well. So there's a lot of filtering just at the level of the DNA itself with regard to fitness of the genetic molecule. And, well, you know, sequence space is so big for your genome, right? You've got three billion base pairs and, uh, you know, two bits per base pair. So what if there's some sequences that aren't tolerated? There's so many more to try. In our system, we're very limited on bit content. And so we were worried that there would be too much phenotype in our genotype. We don't want to go hunting for traits that have differential fitness when a key trait is the genotype itself. We want to be largely genetically largely phenotype neutral with regard to the genotype to expose as much of sequence space as possible without bias. So this is a kind of test experiment where the only difference is the sequence in the gene. And when I say genotype, the only informational difference is in the gene. But there's also physical differences in the gene. And would those have differential consequence with regard to fitness? So, a zigzag plot. You're used to these by now. And... Who's the winner? Now, here we only have to look at what happened in the... You know what? I, 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 I had it wrong in the previous slide. It's a KNNM library. If someone did the numbers, you'd realize that it didn't come out to, to 64, right? If it was K, K, M, M. It's K, N, N, M, and M, N, N, K on the other side. Okay, so if there's no phenotype in the genotype, then it should be a, a coin flip at, at the K and the M positions and a one out of four flip at the, at the N positions. But it isn't. There's some bias just letting these genotypes compete with each other. And so we had to see that, and we had to kind of shake that out of the system. And we understand where this bias comes from. At this position, it much prefers a G over a U. Why? Because, uh, this is just for aficionados, this is very close to the 5' end of the molecule, and it's a transcriptional start site bias. So to eliminate that bias, we put a little leader sequence on the front of the molecule so there'd be no bias at that position. This position has significant bias. It would much rather be a C than an A, and that's to help close down the three-way junction with a GC pair rather than AU pair. So that's some bias, some, gene, some phenotype in our genotype. So we move the random zone uh, over one nucleotide to avoid that bias. Okay. Now we're ready for more complexity, and this is the size libraries we're playing with now. So these are 256 by 256. Now we have NNNN moved out one position with a leader sequence on the front end here. And our combinatorial space now is over 65,000 possible recombinants. And now, rather than, than have the same sequence in the trait region, we're going to have different sequences in the trait region encoded by, associated with, different, corresponding different sequences in the genetic region for each of the two loci. Okay, but now we've got to make those molecules. How do you, how do you make uh, the library of components where you have a gene in 256 different flavors encoding a trait in 256 corresponding flavors? 
We need a genetic code, is what we need. All right? Now, we're not translating the DNA into the, the RNA sequence into something else. We, the code relates the sequence in the gene region to the sequence in the trait region. So what code should we use? There's no answer yet to this question, right? I mean, there's lots of codes we could use. We could, we could make a very conservative code where an A here means we could have four letters here, four letters here, and an A here means an A at the first letter, you know, a, a, a C here means a C at the second letter, a literal match of the code, one-to-one, -one, letter for letter. I think that's a terrible idea because of the propensity of the molecules to confuse what's the gene and what's the trait and, you know, and so on, but, but that would be a code. You could make an inverse code. You could make a code where uh, one letter here, uh, a sparse code, where one letter here relates to more than one letter in the trait region. So here is such a, a sparse code that we've actually implemented where we have the four random nucleotides in the gene region, and likewise for, for trait 2, uh, for, for uh, allele 2, gene, gene 2, trait 2 combination. So we have four different nucleotides in the gene, 12 nucleotides in the trait, and we're going to do a sparse code where each nucleotide in the gene encodes three nucleotides in the trait. Now, of course, in biology, three nucleotides in the gene encode one element in the trait, right? Three nucleotides encodes one amino acid. It's a, it's a reductive code, three to one. This is going to be a sparse code, one to three. And we need a rule. We can make up any rule we want. Uh, in this case, our rule was each genetic nucleotide encodes three non-contiguous trait nucleotides. Okay, they could have been, you know, number one is the first three positions and so on, but we wanted to kind of spread the sparse code out for, if you think about the exploration of sequence space, I don't want to get into that in too much detail, but we thought that was a way to, uh, to, to move through sequence space without hitting, uh, you know, sort of abrupt transitions, a kind of way to smooth the fitness landscape. So position one in the gene encodes positions one, five, and nine in the trait. Position two encodes positions two, six, and ten, and so on. And then we need a lookup table. We actually need the code. And here it is. Here's the actual code we implemented. So it, and, and by the way, the code doesn't have to be the same in each position. It is in biology because, because that's a conservative thing to do. It's parsimonious. But this is a code we make. So, so we actually have a different code at each position. Uh, at position 2, for example, which encodes positions 2, 6, and 10 in the trait, if there's an A in the gene, then it reads G-A-U at positions 2, 6, and 10 in the trait, and so on. And actually, at a certain position, we, we degenerated between the two purines. It's up to you, right? You can make all different codes and do you know, code competition challenges and, and whatever you want. So that's, that's the code. Now we have to actually make the molecule. And the way we made this particular uh, uh, population of molecules was individually. All right? So that's one way to do it. You can synthesize a DNA template that makes all 256 possible gene combinations and all 256 associated trait combinations as a piece of synthetic DNA and then transcribe the RNA from those. So that there, therefore you need 256 different versions of trait 1 and associated gene plus 256 versions of trait 2 and associated gene. So you need to make 512 DNA molecules. We didn't actually make them, we ordered them from IDT, but we ordered 512 different DNAs. They all came in a big styrofoam box one day, and we had our, our code implemented in physical reality. Now, here's another code. In this case, we have four random, random nucleotides in the gene, and we have seven random nucleotides in the trait. So, wait a minute, four to seven, that, how's that going to work out? Well, here's the rule. Each genetic nucleotide encodes either one or two, in this case, contiguous trait nucleotides. These are, these, are, these are issues that are sort of up for grabs until we learn what makes a good code for this molecule and, and for RNA space. And here's the particular lookup table. So position one encodes position seven and six. Position two maps right to position five, and it does it in a one-to-one -one fashion just for fun. But position one, an A here means a GA, a C means a GC, and so on. So that's a code to implement. And in this case, as we built our second code, we knew that we couldn't keep ordering 512 different DNA oligos every time we wanted to change the code. It, would, it's, it costs several thousand dollars, and it's just not elegant. So uh, John Sapansky, a postdoc in the lab, developed a method for synthesizing the whole population of molecules all at once. And that method is uh, what's called split and pool synthesis. Starting from a solid support, he's going to build up the gene part of the molecule and the trait part of the molecule uh, using chemical synthesis. So the idea is you split this solid support into four parts, one for each of the four gene letters. 
you add the gene letter, whether it's A in the A pot, C in the C pot, and so on, uh, to one arm using levulinate uh, protected phosphoramidites. Then you add the one or two or whatever you want, trait nucleotides to the other arm. And then you pool that mixture back into a common mixture. And then you repeat what's that split and pool until you build up the gene letter by letter and the corresponding trait letters by letter. Complete both arms, ligate them together, lay down PCR primers, and develop the entire population all at once. Right? And that's how we built this population. All at once, all ago. And uh, that's the way to do these in the future. And obviously, if we're going to get to even more complex libraries. It's the only way we can afford to do it. So in the, in the time that remains, and I'm supposed to end at 2.14 is what it says on the schedule. OK. In the time, in the, maybe I get to 2.15. <laughs> I have one extra minute. And so let me say the kind of things we want to go hunting for using this, this synthetic genetics. We want to make replication contingent on the execution of other functions beside replication itself. And the idea is there's another part of the molecule, this central stem, that's generic. So we're using the left stem for one of the traits. I'm uh, sorry, for one of the uh, genes encoding trait. We're using the right arm for the other gene encoding trait. But we've got the central stem that's generic, and so this is the place we can put alternative function. For example, we can put what's called an aptamer. An aptamer is a RNA motif that recognizes a target ligand uh, in a specific manner. And the idea is instead of a simple stem loop, we'll have an aptamer domain. An aptamer is, here's an aptamer, this is work of Larry Gold and colleagues, this is Michael Familak and, and Peter Bergstaller. Uh, this aptamer recognizes theophylline, this one recognizes flavin mononucleotide, the RNA molecule is unstructured in the absence of its ligand, but in the presence of its ligand, the RNA binds the ligand, forms a defined structure, which closes this stem, and of course this stem is hanging from the catalytic center of the enzyme. If and only if the ligand is present does the stem close, which then activates the enzyme. So the enzyme can only replicate if the ligand is present. So that makes the replication contingent on theophylline or flavin mononucleotide or whatever the aptamer is sensing. And of course, more broadly, what one wants is an encoded random sequence domain that might, from that random sequence domain, evolve the ability to be an aptamer for a target molecule to catalyze a, albeit simple, given the number of nucleotides, chemical reaction, or to invent whatever it wants. So here's what happens if we put the theophylline aptamer in that central domain. Now, in the presence of theophylline, we get exponential amplification with theophylline present. If there's no theophylline or a closely related molecule that you may have had at lunch, caffeine, differing only by a methyl group compared to theophylline, there's no amplification. So this is now replication contingent on whether you had coffee or tea uh, at lunch. And since we have two traits, we could put the theophylline aptamer here, the flavin mononucleotide aptamer here. And now if both theophylline and flavin mononucleotide are present, and here I just show E, but E prime is along with it, uh, exponential amplification. But if either theophylline or FMN are present, only linear amplification. So one enzyme is on, turning over linearly, but its, its cross catalytic partner is off. So that's the difference between linear amplification and exponential. Furthermore, the concentration of the ligand relative to the, the affinity of the ligand binding site determines the replication rate. Because any moment when the ligand is bound, the enzyme is on. So the higher the concentration of the ligand, the faster the growth rate until it saturates. All right, so this becomes then a isothermal, it all goes at constant temperature, ligand-dependent, quantitative, exponential amplifier for ligand. That means you can use it to do like what people do for qPCR, right? That looks like a, if people have ever run TACMAN, so-called quantitative PCR. You get these kind of growth curves. As you have more and more DNA, uh, the molecules amplify, undergo PCR quicker and quicker. In our case, as you have more and more ligand, amplification goes faster and faster. And just like quantitative PCR, we can declare a threshold, say 25% of maximum extent. We're not counting cycle numbers like you do in PCR. We're counting how long it takes to cross the threshold because it's all operating at constant temperature. And if we plot time to threshold versus concentration of theophylline, we get a nice linear relationship. So that gives you a quantitative sensor for measuring how much tea you had at lunch minus how much you metabolized till 2.14. And why we chose theophylline and, and, and this particular concentration range is this is where clinically people measure the therapeutic range for theophylline if, for asthmatic patients, COPD patients. If you're below that blue bar, uh, you're not protected 
uh, by therapeutically uh, for, for such chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. If you're above that bar, you're at risk for seizures, all right? So people get this measured all the time in the clinic using an antibody, an antibody, though, that can't distinguish between theophylline and caffeine. So that's, that's all I wanted to cover today, except uh, we are obliged to end with a question. And so I'm going to end with two questions. Uh, I'm going to end with the question we are asking ourselves in the lab right now, and then I'm going to end with a question for the students. All right? So the question we're asking ourselves in the lab right now is, what can we do with this thing? What it, might it evolve? And what the lab is actively working on is rather than plugging in pre-configured aptamer domains, we have random sequence in this region encoded by our 256 by 256 library, and we're demanding that novel function be invented in a self-sustained Darwinian evolution system, uh, whether that function be to recognize a ligand or to perform a simple chemical transformation. And because we don't have very many bits of information and therefore not very many bits of encoded trait, it has to be pretty simple functions, and those are the things we're hunting for now. Uh, but the goal is to keep building ever more complexity in the system so that it has more genetic wherewithal to encode more potential function so that it can evolve what, whatever it sees fit, fit in a Darwinian sense. So that's what we ask ourselves in the lab uh, every day. Actually, every day we ask ourselves, how's the prep of the A primes going? And, you know, those kind of questions. But, uh, but that's the big question we ask in the lab, what might it evolve? But here's the question for the students. What is genetics? Okay, I think I've given you a, maybe a mind-expanding view, I hope a mind-expanding view, of what genetics is. So life on Earth is a particular embodiment of genetics, and we can describe how it works. DNA or RNA genetic material, four letters, base pairing, translation system, differential uh, fitness based on differential sequence. But at its core, what is genetics? I already gave you a little diatribe of my own personal view on, on the difference between genotype and phenotype. But what does it take to make a genetics? You know, what is the simplest, I mean, I think we have a synthetic genetics here at a very low bit content, uh, but what are the essential elements of a genetic system? And, and I'd encourage you to think not just about nucleic acid molecules as the basis for carrying that information, right? It's, it goes back to Darwinian principles. It's, it's the ability for molecules to have history. That ultimately is what genetics is, and then the way genetics achieves that is a way to store information in molecules, subject to heritability, subject to mutation, and associate that information with a corresponding physical realization. Whether it's a physical realization in the genotype region itself, or a associated or translated piece of information that correlates with that genetic information. That's some of my answer to that question, but that's, that's a question for the students. All right, thank you, everybody. I want to thank the people in my lab, most of whose names I mentioned. This R3 ligase ribozyme was originally developed by a former postdoc named Jeff Rogers. Uh, Self-replication was first achieved by Natasha Paul and cross-replication by Dong Yun Kim, former postdocs. But Tracy Lincoln was the person who a couple years ago made this thing, as we say, go critical, go exponential and never look back and, and be able to self-sustain its replication. Uh, Bianca Lamb did the work on the ligand-dependent replication that I talked about, including the quantitative ligand-dependent replication. And now the ball is being carried by both Michael Robertson and John Sapansky as they ex build and explore these ever more complex libraries of self-sustained evolving molecules. Thanks.